Hello and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I am here with my co-host, Elwyn Robinson, creator and founder of Genetic Insights and the author of The Rejuvenate Blueprint, which will be available for purchase very, very, very soon. And so today, lovely listeners, we are talking about, discussing, and giving you some practical examples of the Rejuvenate Diet. So tell me, Owen, I'm excited for the book to be coming out soon. So why did you want to share this with our listeners today? Well, this is the other book, much shorter book that I will hopefully have out soon-ish, um, which originally we were going to call The Feel Younger Diet. I think we might actually change that to Rejuvenate uh, Diet to be on brand with the Rejuvenate Blueprint and the Rejuvenate Podcast. And also because, uh, yeah, it's just broader, right? Rejuvenating rather than feeling younger. So we like that. Anyway, uh, we got good f- feedback on those episodes. So the first episode is very broad, and I do encourage people to watch that, like starting from first principles. And if I had to sum that up in one sentence, it would be find out what foods don't agree with you and don't eat them. No matter what me, any other person, any guru, any article you see online, whatever says about, oh, it's so healthy, it's so beneficial, blah, blah, blah. If it doesn't agree with you, don't eat it. That's definitely an oversimplification of that episode, but you know that'll do. Um, and then we did one on like making sure you get your macronutrients, and then we did another one on getting your micronutrients, and then we did one more, which was the first kind of ever so slightly not scientific one, where we talked about the Korean system and how some people, based on the size and capacity of various digestive organs, might do better and worse at digesting certain foods. And so an obvious one would be um, if your liver is strong and produces lots of bile, you're probably going to do better digesting fats than someone who is the opposite. And if your stomach is strong and producing lots of stomach acid, you're going to do better at uh, breaking down protein, for instance. And, you know, if your stomach is already producing a lot of stomach acids, you may not do well with foods that encourage the production of more stomach acids. Like, you know, the, the I think carminatives are often called the herbs, you know, cumin and coriander and um, all these herbs that stimulate uh, stomach acid production, it might be a bad idea if you already have a lot of it. So that's kind of it, again, in a nutshell. And that's what we talked about that episode. It was a little bit unscientific, partly, I admit, because it's based on this uh, Eastern system that, you know, incorporates some Eastern principles as well. Um, although in practice, I find it helpful. And that is the you know the thing that ultimately matters, which is why I, I put it in the uh, podcast anyway. So I'm having more and more clients now who you know, asking about implementing it. And also, you know, I was thinking about this, we've had three people on, uh, at least some of which have very diverse views on everything to do with health. Um, so we've had, and, then, and, and yet I observed that the diets that they were recommending was pretty similar, or at least the, let's say the healing diet, the, this is what you should kind of start with if you're sick diet, although they kind of would digress quite massively about what you should eat if you're no longer unhealthy. And so I'll, I'll name them. So we had um, Hans Amato on, who is more from the Ray Pete School of Thought. And he said, you know, the ideal diet might be beef with some kind of carb that agrees with you. I think the example he gave were like rice and bananas. Um, then we've had Dr. Uh, Garrett Smith on, and he said, you should have a protein that agrees with you, but his favorite is beef. And then some kind of carbs that agree with you. And his favorite, I think, is it was beans. I think in the latest episode, he said apples or apples and bananas. Um, and then he's also talked about rice before and I think oats. And then we have Grant Jenneru, who we've just had an episode of him again recently, who's been doing this 10 years of extreme low vitamin A diet. That's how he looks at it. And he basically said that he was doing primarily bison in fact not beef although he did say in the latest episode that if he could go back he might use beef um and black beans uh, although he did do a bit of sourdough bread at one point and uh, i think he might have done rice as well at some point as well so all very similar right and so i was interested in that and i was like hmm now do i think that's going to agree with everyone no that's the whole point of the rejuvenate diet the filling of diet that's not the avenue i'm going to go down but i was interested to see that these people who um you know, at least the case of the hands as the Ray Pete follower and, uh, you know, Grant and Garrett Smith, who are the anti-vitamin A people, they would have extreme disagreements about vitamin A and a lot of other stuff. And yet they, because, you know, at least two or three are regularly working with people. And I know 
Grant, as well as frequently helping people via email and stuff, um, they have come to similar conclusions because in the end, what works, works. <laughs> what helps people, helps people. However, if you say to people, you know, why don't you just eat a diet of beef and beans, beef and rice, beef and potatoes? I think at least one person mentioned potatoes. I know it wasn't Grant. Maybe it was um, Hans. I think it was Hans, yeah. Beef and potatoes, beef and rice, beef and apples, whatever. A lot of people say, well, that's not a very nutritionally, nutritionally complete diet. And so I was away on holiday recently. And when I go out with Hannah, I, t I, I basically just like, especially because I'm, you know, we were quite active and I basically just want to eat the things that agree with me most, the same principles. Um, I'm a lot more, what's the word, indulging in all kinds of things at home if I know the quality of them and stuff. But when I'm out, I'm pretty simple. And so I was basically just eating uh, steak and potatoes. And I was like, wow, this is like really agreeing with me. This is like, feels so good, um, you know, digestion wise, energy wise, mental clarity, all the rest of it. I was like, maybe I should listen to all these people I'm having on the podcast and just follow a diet of just having these two things for a while. And I was like, well, okay. And, and, and so I wanted, you know, would I do this episode if I was only talking about me? No, but I feel like a lot of people who've watched those episodes maybe have had similar thoughts, right? Hmm, maybe I should try Grant's diet. Maybe I should try Hans's diet, whatever. Um, and so I wanted to actually look into it. So there's a couple of objections to following that kind of diet. Um, in fact, there may be more than a couple. There's a couple I had in mind. What, what objections would you have to following a diet like that, Chrissy? Well, one, there could be the boredom of it. And sometimes people like variety. So that can happen. Also, too, when you are in life and you're going out and let's say you're going out to dinner or you're going over to friends' houses because being on something that restrictive could cause potential limitations to what you feel comfortable with, what you can and how easily you can maneuver when you are you know, not just in your own environment. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, friends' houses I'll give you. I'd say in restaurants, though, most places will sell you some combination of beef and potato or beef and rice. That's actually almost every restaurant will cover that, in my experience. Um, or, I don't know, or chicken and potato and chicken and rice or something like that. Like, if you ask for that kind of combination, they'll, they'll usually happily. And a lot of them, it's not even weird. That's just, you know, <laughs> a normal meal. Uh, it's not like when I used to be on a raw vegan diet and try and get a raw vegan meal. That was a lot more of a challenge. A lot, for... lot more challenging, <laughs> I would have thought, yeah. <laughs> in the average uh, restaurant. Um, so, yeah, fair enough. Well, the boredom thing is definitely one of them. But the other one that I would be focused on, and I feel like a lot of our, because you're very healthy, Chrissy, you know, you just are, but a lot of our um, viewers and listeners might be focused on as well, is, isn't that nutritionally like not very complete, right? It's not a very diverse um, selection of foods, is it? Like, so, so that was really the question that led me down this rabbit hole that I thought might make the interesting subject matter for a whole episode. I mean, we'll see uh, <laughs> if it's not, if we cover it all quickly, maybe this will be half an episode and we'll do something else and stick them together or something. But so I started investigating and I was like, huh, what is the nutritional composition of a uh, steak and potato diet? That's what I started with. And, and I wanted to kind of share that. And I was like going through it and I was like, okay, well, what about if I add this? And what about if I do this and all the rest of it? Um, and I thought this might actually be interesting for, a, uh, for an episode to look at how, again, so we talked about the theory a lot in those previous episodes but the kind of practicalities of how I would put together a diet. Because um, I've already talked about, you know, I'd, I'd base it on macros first, right? And then try and get the micros. But I realize it's very abstract to people. I just saw feedback on another one of my videos, the Rejuvenate Blueprint. They were like, where's the blueprint? And I'm like, mm, I'm talking about the whole episode. But I, I guess maybe what they, I don't, I don't know what they meant. They were thinking I of a guess, visual maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe they were looking for some infographic or something like that. But again, just maybe it was too abstract for them. And I understand for a lot of people that is the case. So I thought, okay, let's be as super practical and specific as possible. But not just with one diet, let's give a bunch. And by the way, you know, my, um, my best client who I speak to every week, he's not a beef and potato man, right? He's that uh, opposite type that that doesn't agree with him at all. So don't worry, uh, I won't name them. But that person, this episode will be for you as well. I'm going to 
go through an example of a, a diet that's not that at all, that's more that opposite type, that lung type that totally shouldn't be having uh, beef or potatoes. And we'll give an example of what that would look like as well, the one that you were diagnosed as as well, Chrissy, although I know you don't follow it very strictly. Um, so let's have a look. So I'm sharing my um, chronometer here. So I've seen you know various people say this is the best one. I must admit it's not the easiest to use, so I was kind of resistant for a while. But I have come to the conclusion that I do like it uh, for the reason that it was actually recommended, that it, it just has the most nutritional information for lots of different types of foods. And that's really what I was looking for. So, um, so let's see. This is one of the ones that I put together, I think. Yeah, this is a little bit complicated. All right, let me just start from scratch, actually. So... Uh, what am I doing? For anyone who wants to follow along and do this with me, I've got this app called Chronometer. You can have it in your iPhone, your whatever, but you can also have it in your browser. So that's where I've got it here. And under foods, there's this thing called custom meals. And so I'm just gonna go to create meals. And so um, let's see what we're gonna call this meal. Uh, you know, maybe just simple and then add item. And you can see a bunch of stuff I already tried adding earlier is already pre-populated there to make this a little bit simple for me. But let's just start with the steak and potato thing, right? Is that something that everyone agrees with? Um, and we'll also do a minced beef and potato because that's obviously the cheaper version. Um, so I'm going to add potato. Now I'll work this out for me um, with my energy requirements and all the rest of it. It's pro And also just what I can actually comfortably eat. Um, it's probably around like 1,200 grams a day of a potato. Um, so about 400 grams per meal. That's equivalent of about one medium sized baked potato and about half a dozen new potatoes. Um, that's what I, when I was eating out in these restaurants, that's what I tended to order along with my steak. That felt very comfortable. That wasn't too much for me. Now, obviously, again, this is only just an example. Different people are going to have different um, needs and you know capacities and all the rest of it. So that's one thing. And then I'll also add in, first I'll do steak. So I've chosen uh, filet mignon, my favorite type. Um, it's low fat. So that's, you know, generally um, in the case of uh, Grant, although he seems to have changed his mind and Dr. Smith, they, they would prefer a low fat beef. So that's fine. Um, so let's say we wanted to have just that diet. Now, I realize uh, neither of the two people I just mentioned are, are in love with potatoes. But as I said, I'm just starting with something that is very easy to get at any restaurant. But we'll switch it up. We'll try rice. We'll try apples. We'll try a bunch of different... Or we'll try beans. We'll try a bunch of different options. So that's... Uh, oh, and I've got to put an amount there. So what I found, again, for me, is the amount of steak that I can eat a day comfortably easily uh, is about 500 grams. So that's what I'm going to put about 170 grams per portion, three meals a day, something like that. So if we scroll down, we can see the nutrients of this. And it's actually pretty comprehensive. That is why I've ended up saying, you know, liking this chronometer. So, right, so I'm just looking just at the top. So that was essentially, is that for the day? So like there it's saying your energy, like you're taking in 1,932 calories for the day. Okay, yeah. Yeah, now I, I've started with those bare minimum. I would always add fat. So my calories are going to be more and we'll discuss that. Um, but I'm, I'm just starting with that absolute basic recommendation from um, these people, right? I'm just giving a few versions. But yeah, that would be too low calories to me. So I would up that by increasing fat. Uh, but these are options, right? So we'll get to that. But yeah, we're talking about, you know, 2000 calories for a normal size and hmm, maybe not normal, close to ideal weight person <laughs> with a reasonable lifestyle. That's probably a reasonable amount of calories, right? That might be okay. Um, and it's a lot of protein. That's one of the things to notice. Um, yeah, 173 say, grams of protein right there. Yeah, I would say that's a, it's a lot of protein compared to what most people eat, but I would say it is a good amount of protein. Um, I would actually say it's uh, most people do not eat enough protein. So when you have enough protein, you feel satiated. It gives your body the building blocks for everything that it needs. I've talked about this before in the previous episode. Um, generally for men, they say, you know, about one gram per pound. Uh, so I'm 180 pounds. This is 173 grams. <laughs> That's pretty close, right? Um, obviously, again, if you are smaller, then you could easily go less. 
So, um, yeah, types of sugars and all that, I wouldn't focus on that hugely. But yeah, so one of the things that's interesting is the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6, very that favorable. That is interesting. Yeah, this is definitely a lot more in-depth than, uh, than others that I've seen. Yeah, yeah. It actually, it has all the information. We didn't go through that, but you know, I know in this case it has all the information for potato and beef steak. It gives you like loads of brand names. If I'd have chosen like, I don't know, Kroger beef steak or something, then it might not have all this information about the micronutrients. But the ones that I selected, which are generic, it does. Um, so it has a good ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. I'd say all the things we're going to investigate today probably do, but I just want to point out compared to a normal diet, that's very desirable. Um, you know, it's a hell of a lot less inflammatory than the vast majority of diets. Uh, it's got a good amount of monounsaturated fats as well, which is supposed to be beneficial, right? And a decent amount of saturated fat. Um, it's got a reasonable amount of cholesterol. I'm not bothered about that level of cholesterol at all. Um, so it's got a high amount of protein, as we've talked about. Um, it's, you know, it's got a decent amount of all the amino acids that I want. It's maybe a little bit too much tryptophan and a little bit much too much uh, cysteine and methionine, which are the um, the maybe the aging amino acids for a repeat follower. They would believe that, and we've you know shown studies in previous episodes that do indicate that. Um, but you wouldn't want to completely remove those amino acids either. So one of the things, and it's not super high in glycine. So in order to address the amino acid balance here, um, you have I'd say a couple, well, a few different options. First of all, you could add more um, connective tissue meat. So this is just a steak, right? But you'll see how it changes a little bit, even when we just put um, minced beef instead of steak. And then certainly if, the thing is, I like to eat my steak pretty raw these days, like a rare, Chrissy. Um, Same. <laughs> yeah, okay, there you go. Especially yeah. when you have that delicious steak that I mm -hmm. <laughs> introduced you to, right? Definitely. But, um, <laughs> but uh, if, um, so that is the disadvantage of the, you know, the high connective tissue meats is they're going to be cooked for a long time, like your Osobuco or any of these other kind of, um, uh, you know, the uh, shanks and all that kind of stuff. They all have to be cooked a long time. But to, uh, in so, order to get the extra glycine, would you either opt in for some bone broth or for some so this additional is what I'm powders? Saying. Yeah. So one option would be higher connective tissue meat. It's just that they have to be cooked for a long time. I don't love meat that's been cooked for hours. Uh, number two, yeah, you could go for some actual bone broth that you make yourself, which, again, it's mainly the connective tissue that would um, increase the glycine. Uh, well, that you make yourself all that you buy, kind of the same thing, as long as it's good bone broth. Number three would be to go for collagen peptides. Um, that's something I was doing for a while. I'm kind of stopping it at the moment, actually just because I feel like I'm really having loads of protein. I know some people say it doesn't count for protein, but it still does to your kidneys and everything, so... Um, I'm actually stopping that. And I'm actually just doing the fourth option, which is just having some glycine. I really like glycine. Um, you know, it tastes sweet. It's convenient. I actually think it's purer and less adulterated than collagen peptides often are because it's just isolated down to one element, whereas collagen peptides, it's still, it's got a bunch of stuff in there. So I'm kind of more on the fence of, I'm more on the side of uh, glycine these days. Uh, but those are the four options I'm aware of to, to kind of optimize that that ratio and that balance. Um, but what I was also interested in, and this is what I wanted to show people, is the um, the situation with the uh, micronutrients. So we can see thiamine. I'm actually surprised that's as low as it is uh, based on what I saw before. Okay, I was adding a couple of other things, so maybe that's why. Uh, so anyway, the thiamine, we're looking at like 100%. Uh, riboflavin over 100%, niacin well over 100%, but not too much. That's a decent amount of riboflavin. Uh, sorry, niacin. Uh, B5, B6, decent amount of those. B12, very decent amount. So it's a level that unless you had a deficiency, you wouldn't need to supplement B12. Um, didn't tell you buy it, unfortunately. Choline, you can see that. I mean, I go around everywhere telling yeah, the people. Yeah, choline, that's eat, a lot, yeah. Unless you eat liver or egg yolks, you're not going to have enough choline. That's actually not quite true. If you do eat loads of beef, <laughs> you can actually also get a decent amount of choline. Um, and so maybe we'll get to the point of, yeah, we will get to the point of seeing how that changes if you have a different type of protein source. But beef, definitely good for choline. And I actually think that's one of the reasons it's considered to be healthy for the liver types is because um, that choline keeps the bile flowing, stops it getting um, 
overly thickened and you know leading to cholestasis that we've talked about before. Now, one um, downside that this diet does have that is significant to me is the lack of folate. You can see that there. It's only got 27% this amount of folate. Um, so that would be something that I would be concerned about with this diet, and I would look to either supplement or add in an additional food to make sure that I got enough. Folate is that important. It's definitely not something you want to run on such a deficit on for such a long time. The vitamin A, um, that's obviously the point of this diet. <laughs> from <laughs> several people's Yeah, I can point see there, 0.8% to vitamin A. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, now, you, if you actually want vitamin A, I'm going to make a recommendation about how you add that in a minute. Um, vitamin C, you might be surprised it's well over 100% even of vitamin C. Um, so that's down mainly to the potatoes. Uh, although, as the carnivores point out, there is some vitamin C in beef as well that is not like detected through usual testing. But whatever. If you add the potatoes, you've got some vitamin C too. Uh, D is not covered. Most diets will not cover your vitamin D. Uh, this is something you only need to get from sunlight or supplementation, so I'm not worried about that. It is very low in vitamin E. That's one I'm a little bit more on the fence on. Um, I know certainly uh, Grant and uh, Dr. Smith would not be concerned about that. Certainly Dr. Smith, he believes vitamin E is a poison that we shouldn't have, just like vitamin A. Um, you know, Hans, the other person we mentioned today, he would be bothered about that, I'm pretty sure. You know, he's a fan of vitamin E. So... That's a question. Do I need to get more from food? Do I need to get more from supplementation? And we'll look as I start adding in other things what that does to the vitamin E level. And then the vitamin K. So the vast majority of vitamin K as we change stuff here that it's going to register is going to be like K1, not K2. It's actually very hard to get enough K2 from diet unless you're having natto pretty much. Um, so... I mean, there are a couple of things that I do add to my diet that have this vitamin K over 100%, but it's 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 almost all K1. So again, that's not something I'm too bothered about. Vitamin K2 is just something you need to supplement in the majority of cases, unfortunately. All right, and on to the, from many people's perspective, including Dr. Smith, um, all important minerals, right? So now... Dr. Smith would not be worried about this. The um, Why am I referencing these people so often, by the way? Because I know a lot of people who are watching this channel either are fans of, currently are fans of Dr. Smith or Grant or Ray Pete. So I'm kind of calling out those philosophies specifically. Um, so calcium, I'm not happy with that. That is too low calcium for me. First of all, I have an increased genetic need for calcium. And second of all, I have lead poisoning. And one of the risk factors for lead poisoning, in terms of it like being reabsorbed, even through, like, so the bile is going to try and excrete the lead. About a third of it gets excreted through bile, two thirds are excreted for the kidneys. So the bile is going to try and excrete the lead. If I don't have enough calcium on my diet, then my body is going to reabsorb more of that lead. So I'm not happy with such a low level of calcium. For you, there may be a different reason why you want more calcium. Maybe you're a follower of Ray P and you strongly believe that calcium is a good thing and that you should have as much as possible in relation to phosphorus. Fair enough. Uh, maybe you've been told you have osteoporosis or risk for it. Maybe you have a genetic factor. Maybe you've, your doctor sold you that, DEXA scan or whatever. Maybe that's why you want to have more calcium, right? So there's different reasons why someone might want to up their calcium. Um, but if you do, then first of all, you should make sure you are getting enough vitamin D, again, either from light or from supplementation. And second of all, because that increases the rate at which your body absorbs the calcium. But unfortunately, that will also increase the rate at which your body absorbs the lead, in my case. Because again, the body can't tell the difference. So everything I do to increase the absorption of calcium will also increase the absorption of lead. Uh, so I just need more calcium. Um, so if you, want, uh, if you want to add calcium, that's like one of the first changes I'm going to make to this. But um, let's look at that. Then copper. The copper is pretty high. Um probably higher than a lot of people, certainly um, on Dr. Smith's side, would like. However, copper has to be taken into account in relation to zinc. And we can see the zinc here actually is higher than the right, okay. copper. Yeah, because I was going to say, when I, first, when I first took a look, is it looking at the copper, it's 263%. Yes, That's but then looking, yeah, it's very high. But then looking at the zinc, like you're just talking about the ratios, we're looking at 324%. So the zinc is definitely beating the copper here. And I'd say pretty high because 
I'm pretty sure up until relatively recently, like a decade or two ago, two milligrams was the recommended daily value, not 100 mill not one milligrams. So that's partly why it's so high is because they've just changed the daily value. Obviously, Dr. Smith would say it's good. Some of the very angry people underneath that episode of the Dr. Smith episode who love copper would say that's right. Uh, sorry, that that's bad, that you know we need more copper. Um, so that's a bit of a judgment call. I think the more in the middle perspective is that you just want the right ratio between zinc and copper. And I'd say that's a pretty good ratio between zinc and copper, um, like 35 to 2. That's uh, not bad at all. And it doesn't have molybdenum in here, unfortunately. It's one of the few things that it has lower. But anyone who was worried about copper, copper maybe because they have a genetic tendency for copper accumulation, maybe because they know they have copper accumulation, um, then you don't necessarily have to change this diet. You could just have more molybdenum because that it kind of helps the body excrete zinc and copper and iron, but it helps the body excrete copper most. So increasing the molybdenum, um, this, I mean, this blank right now, but I think this is accurate. There is, I think there's very little molybdenum in beef or potato, but it's going to test be high in beans. So we'll see when we add beans, if that increases it or not. Um, then we've got magnesium. This is interesting. Um, you know, everyone has said, including me, it's so hard to get enough magnesium from your diet. Well, look at how much magnesium we're getting. Just with beef yeah, and potato. Yeah, fair amount. I mean, yeah, uh, over 100%. That's good. Yeah, it is. And it's certainly more than most people get. One of the things I asked you to do to prepare for this um, episode, Chrissy, is to just tell us what your diet is. So we're going to add yours in. The, yeah, that was a sneak peek day. of just yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yesterday. And I realized you have a very varied diet. Um, yes. But yeah, just, just yesterday as a like a random, and we'll see what the nutrition is for you. We don't know. It may be better than this. It may be worse. My suspicion, suspicion is it won't be that different. And that's kind of the point that I want to make, that you know we're taught we have to have this extremely varied diet because otherwise we're going to be missing nutrients. Well, you know, yeah, we'll see if you still feel that way by the end of this episode. Yeah, because yeah, um, it's interesting with me as well. It's like yesterday was a day of just, I'm going to, you know, have what I'm going to have. It was the weekend. There are other days, of course, where I'm more focused and like, okay, really, I'm going to concentrate on my macros. I'm going to do that. But that's why I also too wanted just to choose yesterday because it's just not looked at, not planned, not anything. Yep. Yeah, great. Um, so phosphorus is pretty high. Now, you know, Ray Pete, would say this disastrous, this ratio of calcium to phosphorus. Phosphorus is acidic, is the most acidic mineral. Calcium is the most alkaline mineral. This is a very high ratio of acid to alkaline. I know, you know, we, we probably have some carnivore people watching as well. They're going to be like, that's not a problem, maybe, <laughs> a lot of them. Uh, you know, people who eat just steak, for instance, that's obviously normal and they do just fine or they're healing themselves of all these diseases. Fair enough. Um, but, you know, it's potentially an issue, right, depending on the situation or the rest of it. So that's another thing. Other than just having the copper being low, I would also want the, the ratio of calcium to phosphorus to be a bit higher at least. Um, the potato, uh, sorry, potassium is also impressively high to me. Potassium is a very important mineral, not often focused on. I see a lot of people these days talk about actually how suboptimal levels of potassium is actually more widespread than magnesium, suboptimal levels of magnesium. And I, you know, from my understanding, this is accurate. One of the reasons is because the more stress you have, the more your body excretes potassium. So this is a big factor. So we're in a very stressed, very stressful, um, obviously, environment and all that, as we've talked about many times before. So I'm not saying you shouldn't have high sodium as well. I'm a, I'm a fan of salt. I just didn't include it here. But obviously, I would have salt with my beef and potatoes. Otherwise, it would be inedible. Um, I don't have liberal amounts of salt. But... You know, I want to make sure I have plenty of potassium with it. Um, the two go together, the yin and yang. And so I'm happy that this includes plenty of potassium. In fact, I was supplementing with potassium for quite a while because my potassium levels were low in my red blood cell tests. And I feel like if I was on this diet, I wouldn't need to because this is you know very good. This is a decent amount of potassium. Uh, also notice how high selenium is. Um, I think the average selenium supplement that most people buy is 200 micrograms sometimes 100 micrograms this is already three times daily value and i know selenium varies a bit depending on you know location and stuff like that but you know again a lot of people are, oh in order to have selenium you need to have brazil nuts you need to have this or that eh, you could just have beef and potato <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> the simplicity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, again, 
If you're panicking about this, oh God, I don't want it. It's not, look, if you like variety, it's fine. We're gonna explore more varied options as we go on. But some people, like me, especially, just want things to be as simple as possible. Like, honestly, like when I go to a restaurant, when I eat, like, you know, especially people who are, you know, working long hours, maybe they're, you know, constantly thinking about a business and whatever, right? They don't have to think about, oh God, what am I going to eat next, right? They just want it to be simple. And I work with a lot of high performance people and I have done and, you know, some of them like luxury and lavishness, it's true, but a lot of them just want simplicity. Um, and so I think I saw some some success gurus say that like most highly successful people eat basically the same meal every day. Um, it definitely really takes, yeah, it definitely takes all the, oh, the extra out of it because especially if you're on the go and you are back to back with so much stuff, simplicity helps you be more efficient in the, in that area. Now, if you don't enjoy it and it's not fulfilling you, then it's not a good idea. We talked about that all the way back in episode one, but there is a significant percentage of the population to whom this is pretty satiating and enjoyable, right? This is the point. This is not a, uh, what's the word, restrictive diet um, to a lot of people. Now, if it is to you, fair enough, right? You may need more variety, you may be a different type. But, you know, I, I, I do like, I can't remember again, I'm, quote, I'm doing lots of quotes without remembering who they're from. But, you know, I like the quote as well of um, food is meant to be fuel, not entertainment. You know, I, I kind of agree with that. Now, this is obviously not the perfect diet, right? It's got a couple of gaps, as we've talked about. Um, we could say that the, um, it's actually got 100% of fiber as well. We didn't really talk about that, but that's another one, mainly soluble fiber. Um, but we could say, all right, what are the gaps? So uh, it doesn't have much vitamin E. Maybe we have an issue with that. Um, it doesn't have any K1, I guess we might have an issue with that. Um, and it had low folate. The main things that I had an issue with with this diet is low folate, low calcium, and possibly low vitamin E. But the low folate and the low calcium, I definitely wanted to address, right? But I suppose before I talk about how I would address that in my case, let's just look at a couple of other um, versions of this that um, maybe some of these other gurus recommended. So let's remove the potatoes and why don't we add uh, black beans, right? The grant diet. So add black beans. Uh, so cooked from dried. And a mount. Uh, so I talked to Grant about this. I wasn't 100% clear. I've had some people on social media say he only has half a cup a day. When we talked, he said he had 50% of his calories from carbs. And that's only black beans. So uh, I don't actually lot. know what that yeah, is. I guess. Yeah. Half a cup is just like one serving. So he, it sounds like he's having more than that. So I'm just going to guess. Let's put in a kilo and see what it comes up with. So um, if it's a kilo, then, sorry, uh, what's it saying? 6%. Hmm, that's weird. But anyway, all right. So 242 protein, 149 carbohydrate, and 50 grams of fat. Um yeah, 86. That's a lot of protein. <laughs> it is a lot of protein. Yeah. Is it too much protein? Well, this is like, I mean, okay, so first of all, wait a minute, 2,000. So Grant was only having 1,500 calories, I think he said. That's exactly so he was what having he said, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. So I'm having 50% more than that. I'm probably 50% bigger than him, you know, so that's fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a lot of protein per pound even but it's not crazy some bodybuilders talk about having two grams per pound could it put a stress on the kidneys or whatever maybe a little bit this is kind of a dubious area um but you know i wouldn't be uh too concerned about it uh personally unless i had kidney issues so yeah sorry total carbs it's not saying it as a percentage for some oh here we go 41 percent. okay well I mean, maybe, I know you said he was like draining the fat away when he was having his beef. Uh, let's say it was roughly a kilo that he was having then, I guess. Um, oh, no, sorry, and he, you know, his calories are less. So maybe he was having 600 grams, 700 grams, something like that a day, cooked, weight. Maybe it was 50%. I think that makes sense. But anyway, this I'm just doing this for someone my weight for now, right? So, okay. 
So how does that change things, right? Well, uh, we talked about the carbs already. What else? So the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio is still very good, right? About two to three. No issues with that at all. Decent amount of monounsaturated and saturated fat. I'm happy with that. Um, the protein balance, you know, it's pretty similar. Uh, a bit higher levels of aspartic acid and glutamic acid, I think, than before, which is going to be from the beans. Maybe not as much tyrosine as I'd want, just in relation to some of those other ones. Uh, decent amount of lysine, though. I mean, I, I, you know, the only one I'd be concerned about is the glycine again. Same conversation we had before, like the collagen, the, the bone broth, whatever. Uh, was it done to everything else? It definitely increased the thiamine, the B1, so that's good. Um, it's decreased some of the other ones, though, by removing the potatoes. So this is basically swapping potatoes for beans. What's it done, right? Um, it's increased the choline even more, slightly. <laughs> um it's whopped up that fo folate massively now. Wow, so we've, yeah, 385%, we've yeah. We've definitely resolved that folate issue with that in one fell swoop, just with that one change. And we haven't created any other deficiencies, at least in this top section. Uh, but we've created deficiency here. See, vitamin C is now zero. Interesting. So, so we swapped out the folate for the vitamin C. Vitamin C is in potato, it's not in beans. Now, obviously, if we were perfectly capable of digesting both, could we have half of each? Absolutely. We can do that next and see what it looks like. Um, it's also increased the vitamin E up to almost 100%. So if we were worried about that, then we'd be happy. If we didn't want vitamin E, maybe we've gone the wrong direction, <laughs> depending on how you feel about it. Uh, it's up to calcium a bit, but not hugely. It still wouldn't have resolved that calcium issue for me. So I would not feel satisfied by that. So, okay. So it's kind of, um, it's resolved one issue, which is the folate and it's created a new one, the lack of vitamin C. I think that would be my simple summation. Other than that, it's also reduced the potassium. That potassium was mainly coming from, well, the meat and potatoes, obviously, but a lot of it is coming from the potatoes. So I would, you know, so you can see where overall, potatoes agree with me perfectly well. Um, you know, uh, beans have got more like FODMAP stuff that leads to fermentation. A lot of people, it creates gas, wind, all that kind of stuff. I know it has more of the type of soluble fiber that is good for binding bile, which is why um, some people are a fan of it. But I'm happy to take charcoal or cholestyramine to do that. I don't need my food for that. That's my way of thinking about it. So this is why for me, overall, I prefer potatoes to beans. Now, it, of course, it's not either or, right? You could just do half of each. If you did half of each, I can tell you it wouldn't change much. It would just mean that there was a, like <laughs> uh, close, it would be like 50% of your vitamin C needs and it would be like, uh, you know, you'd still easily meet your folate needs. So that would be an easy way of resolving it, right? Just get a little bit of each. Right. Which is a good option, especially if you find that you're able to digest each, each of those well, because then you're getting a little bit more of an array if that's what you want. Exactly. Uh, all right, well, what about white rice? You know, a lot of people recommend that. It's supposed to be uh, hypoallergenic, right? Genetic Insights provides cutting edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. 
Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your Genetic Insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, you'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. Yeah, and I'm just picking these simple ones again because with our brand name, it's gonna have the most uh, nutritional information, cooked in non solid water. And again, I'm just gonna do it for gram. And I'm gonna say, look, if I could have a kilo of potatoes, I'm probably gonna have about a kilo of rice. It's gonna be pretty simple. So I'm gonna put that in. And let's see what that does to things. So it's brought the protein down a bit. Uh, it's brought the carbs up a bit because the um, rice is very pure carbs. So if you're really trying to up your carbs, then this would be a good strategy for that element. Um, and also if you're trying to avoid FODMAPs, which you know obviously create digestive issues with a lot of people, you can see this list here has zero of any FODMAPs. So this is a zero FODMAP diet for people with IBS and SIBO and all that kind of stuff. So that's a potential benefit as well. Um, the omega-6, three to six ratio is still pretty good. Um, two to one, totally fine. Very low amounts of both, of course. So the non-Ray Pete fans might think, you know, this is a bit of a deficiency. But, um, you know, I don't think any of the people I cited would have an issue with that. Um, and then amino acids, it's not going to change. Basically, all we're seeing the amino acids now is only the beef because there's pretty much no amino acids in one white rice. It's negligible. Um, so let's look at the vitamins. All right, so we can see now, we can see the potatoes. We think of white potatoes and white rice as if they're interchangeable, right? They're both like empty carbs. Um, but that's not quite true, as you can see. So by switching out the potatoes with the white rice, we are now uh, low on thiamine, this really important um, vitamin that I've talked about a lot. We're low on riboflavin. I mean, I'd want to have, you know, well over that 100% ideally. Uh, we, we have less niacin, less plantophilic acid, less, it, pretty much less of all these B vitamins by doing that. Uh, the choline is still decent, but um, so that's pretty much the same as the potatoes, I think. The folate is still low, so we haven't addressed that. Um, the C is zero. Non-existent, so. yeah. So we've got the worst of both worlds now, no folate and no C. Um, and not as much vitamin E either. Not as much as the beans. I think it's similar to the potato, from what I remember. Like, yeah, but yeah, certainly not an improvement. The K, I think, is even lower. Um, and even less calcium, right? As much as the potatoes didn't have much calcium, they had some. That I think it was 20% before. So we've got even less calcium. The copper is also down. Um, I, I think that copper that's left must be just from the steak. I think there's very little in the rice. Um, the magnesium is now much lower, right? So we can see again, the potassium is way lower now. So now, if rice agrees with you and potatoes don't agree with you, don't eat potatoes and maybe eat rice, right? I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, if you're trying to build a perfect diet, like... Don't listen to this idea that, you know, they're both empty calories and rice is better just based on someone's opinion, right? Look it up for yourself. And when I look it up, it looks to me like potatoes is pretty much better in every way than rice, except for maybe in this FODMAP category. Actually, I can't even remember. Maybe even the FODMAP category doesn't matter. Let me just try adding it. Just checking that. Potato. Actually, I've got boiled with skin. I should have done without skin, sorry, because I don't eat with skin. Um, potato boiled without skin. Okay, I don't think it changes it much. Um, one kilo. Uh, yeah, so what was I checking? Uh, yeah, glucose. Yeah, a little bit of fructose. I mean, f for people ultra, ultra reactive to FODMAPs, then the um, 
But even within the FODMAP diet, that's such a small amount for a day's allowance that it would be like allowed, that it wouldn't be an issue. So yeah, the riboflavin is still a little bit low. Um, but yeah, as we said, vitamin C is almost there. So yeah, actually it's changed it a bit. It's even less calcium about the skins, but potato skins are not digested. I've done enough colonics to know they just go in one end, come out the other, uh, whatever they contain, whether they contain calcium or not. So, um, yes, I'm glad I created that. But anyway, very low calcium diet. Um, it's a bit low in manganese as well. Um, unfortunately, um, Yeah, potassium still reasonably high. Okay, so yeah, it's lowered everything a bit to remove the skin, but the skin isn't really digested. That is the problem with a lot of these things. So, so there we go. Still better than um, still better than uh, rice to me, and beans to me for reasons I've talked about. Now, what about apples? This is the other thing often recommended. We'll do apples, and then we'll do banana, and then I'll start talking about adding other stuff. Um, so apple fresh. Well, I think Grant said that he gets rid of the skin. So do you have a preference of skin on, skin off? I would do skin off, but I'm not sure if they are going to have a decent nutrition for it. So let's see. Let's I'll certainly try it. So is he eating a kilo of apples? I don't know. Um, I know yeah, certainly I some of was... the... Yeah, I don't think he was specific on how much. I can't remember. Well, again, all right. So this is based on someone who desires like a high... Yeah, you could have at least that actually, because it's not much carbs for apples. So I guess I guess he must be having at least that if that's if that were his only carb source. I'm not sure if it is. But let's say hypothetically, right? Because this is what we're talking about. One carb that agrees with you, one protein that agrees with you. So I guess to get anywhere near enough carbs, you'd have to have two kilos. That gives you then a reasonable amount of carbs. Yeah, okay. Eh, I don't know, 46% actually, that's quite a lot. Reduce that a little bit. Like, let's do 1,500. Okay. So, so let's look what apples do to this picture. I actually haven't done this one before, so I'll be discovering with you guys. Ooh, fantastic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, way high in fructose. So, anyone with FODMAP issue, anyone with an issue of fructose, that's a red flag. That's not going to happen. Uh, but of course, many people don't have that issue. Um, it's actually a pretty low fiber diet if you're removing the skin, interestingly enough. Certainly no, no more fiber than the potato option without skin. Um, and much less than the black beans, obviously. Beans are high fiber. So uh, saturated fat... Uh, omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, all that really stays the same. It's all pretty good. Uh, this will be the same again as with the rice or whatever. There's very little protein in apples. So we're really down to the vitamins and minerals again. So uh, a bit less thiamine, a bit less pentophenic acid, which is interesting because panto comes from the word pan, like it, as in everywhere. Um, like uh, so... Like there's pantophenic acid in everything. So it's interesting that when you change it to apples, there's, there's still less. Uh, it was the same with white rice, to be fair, but still interesting. Um, pyridoxine is less. So yeah, a bit less of all the B vitamins, except for t t uh, 12, but that's all coming from the uh, steak. Choline still fine, but again, it's coming from the steak. Folate, it's definitely not helping the folate either. Look at that. No, only 12%, yeah. So that's not good. And the vitamin A has definitely gone up a bit. Yes, it's not nothing. I mean, I don't know if Grant might contest this because he might say that the uh, you know the beans or rice or whatever have some as well. That's a not little bit noticing. Yeah. I'm not sure, yeah. but yeah. So and when we when anyway. we say that, it's only three point three percent the vitamin A. Yeah, it's still very low. Absolutely. Um, obviously, now when you're adding a fruit, would you expect it to add you know vitamin C? Definitely. But interesting that a kilo and a half of uh, apple is adding less vitamin C than a kilo of potato. <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, 
doesn't change vitamin E, doesn't change D, doesn't change K, I didn't think it would. Uh, doesn't change calcium. We've got less copper now. Mm-hmm. So I, Yeah, a uh, lot less, yeah. So for those who want to reduce copper, that's maybe another reason. Yeah, definitely a lot less copper and the zinc is still pretty high. Uh, less iron, I think. Probably not less than the rice, but less than, you know, with the beans and the potato. Uh, very low magnesium, low manganese, which I do believe is a central mineral. Um, lower phosphorus, that's kind of good, but it's still really high in, in ratio to calcium. And it, ah, it's not even good. I mean, ATP is made out of phosphorus, so there's an argument to be made that, you know, it's not great to have less phosphorus. Very low potassium, despite the famous thing about fruit being high in potassium. Um, still high in selenium, but that's the beef. Still high in zinc, but that's the beef. Yeah. Now, I know people who love apples are going to be, oh, Elwin, you're missing the point. Apples are high in, like, other stuff. Yes, apple is high in glucaric acid, um, which helps to detoxify things. I'm a fan. Apple is high in malic acid. I'm a fan. Um, apple is, you know, high in pectin. I'm a fan, as long as the person can handle it. So uh, I'm not saying there's no benefit to apples, but what I am saying is just when we're looking at nutrition, you know, facts are facts, right? It's it's not looking that great, even compared to something like a potato, which, yes, I realise is a nightshade and can contain troublesome amounts of solanine, which is like a toxin that some people really struggle with. Um, so yes, I realize that there are some positives to apple that are not listed here. And I realize there's negative potatoes not listed here, but again, just looking nutritionally, assuming that each of these things agree with you, right? Um, so far, my favorite out of all these carb sources is still potato. Uh, first of all, it's cheap. Second of all, it's easily available. Um, as we talked about any restaurant, will serve you steak and potato or burger and potato without a problem. Um, and third of all, it just does seem to be, you know, very good nutritionally. Uh, and personally, I don't know, I'd struggle eating. Yeah, I don't know, maybe I wouldn't. I'm trying to think. That much apple? That's a lot of apple. I mean, there yeah. is that that thing of after a certain amount of time, how much of it can you actually eat? You know, you do get fatigue with certain foods. You do, yeah. I mean, I must say, I did not reach that with steak and potato. Um, but yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. But certain ones, you're like, oh, gosh, eat more. You know, oof, yeah. So I think what we'll do now is, I uh, just want me to save it. Okay, we'll save that version then. Um, so now I'm going to show you, like, the thing that I came to is, like, um, this is, like, something that I really like. So I've left the steak and potato. And I'll show you how I did it. Maybe we'll like remove one at a time and show you what the difference is. So the next one I added is MCT oil, three tablespoons a day. I find I can have a tablespoon of every meal. Uh, it produces no digestive discomfort. Some of the benefits of MCT oil are it's a type of fat that the liver doesn't have to process. Uh, so it spares the liver. It's um, a it contains a form of energy, which is extremely easy for your body to utilize, actually even easier than glucose. The uh, uh, ketones um, and it's especially easy for your brain to utilize so I like that aspect of it and number three the type I use which is C8 MCT oil perfectly common um, is caprylic acid and caprylic acid for those of you who have ever had candida or thought you have candida you might recognize it because it's it's in pretty much every anti-candida formula it's a very strong antifungal but in a like if you buy it in a pill it might have 100 milligrams of C8 caprylic acid I'm consuming 45,000 uh, milligrams of MCT oil by having this much per day. So I'm having loads of this antifungal oil, basically. And it's true, since I've been doing this, I've tested many times in my digestive system, even after a course of antibiotics with Faximin, zero fungal activity. <laughs> Just this and only this seems to be very effective at that. So... It's not an amount you maybe would start on tomorrow if you know you want to build up to it, but um, but that's why I utilize that. Uh, what does that do to the nutritional values? Not a lot other than adding fat. It doesn't contain any minerals, any vitamins, anything basically other than oil. So that one's simple. Ditto with this glycine, right? I just add glycine for the reasons I talked about earlier. I want to increase the ratio of glycine to methionine, especially. Um, and so this is I've done I've done it all. I've done collagenous meats, 
I've made my own bone broth for a while. I tried collagen peptides for a while. At the moment, I'm liking just doing glycine, whichever ones you want. But you should probably do something like that, especially if you're having steak. It's almost as important if you're having minced beef or, or minced bison instead, but not quite as much. Now, it's the first controversial one, of course. Cheese. <laughs> 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 so why am I putting in cheese? I actually don't eat beans, so I should remove that. But I think I put it in because it, for those who like it, it kind of really made the nutrition very good, as you'll see in a sec. Um, why am I putting in cheese? All right. First of all, it doesn't disagree with me. Second of all, it's probably the best way to get in calcium. What are the other options of getting in high calcium from food, not supplementation? You know, the Ray Peak community, they talk about using ground up eggshells. I mean, what can I say other than ugh? You know, yeah, I don't really want to no. be eating that. <laughs> um, now, it is in uh, beans. It is in greens. So the black beans, you'll see when we do before and after, like it does boost the calcium somewhat. I think the black beans especially are fairly high. The problem is most of the calcium, just like we saw earlier, the potato peels, most of the calcium in greens and most of the calcium in beans is tied up to anti-nutrients, which prevent them being absorbed. Uh, so phytates at best but often oxalates in the case of greens and calcium oxalate is actually a net negative for the system so yes it's calcium but it's a form of calcium that is not easily absorbed by your body and it's oxalate which is kind of a toxin that your body has to deal with so that's why that would not uh, yes i realize there's calcium in greens and yes i realize there's calcium in beans yes i realize also there's calcium in nuts and seeds but that's not why I mean, there are other reasons maybe I wouldn't go for those as options, but you know, one of them is it's just not a good source of calcium in reality. It's bound up calcium that your body struggles to digest. Um, now, another option when we go when we look at the fish eaters, we'll see like a you know like a tin sardines where you're eating the bones as well. That's a great source of calcium, you know. So that's potentially another for the non meat eaters. Um, but anyway, if you are a kind of meat and cheese is fine for me type which, you know, in the Korean system is the liver type, then cheese is an option for you to consider. So when I looked at the various different types of uh, cheeses, uh, Gouda was one, or Gouda, I think you Americans call it for some I reason. I always say Gouda, yeah. <laughs> yeah, is uh, one of the ones that had like the best ratio of calcium to vitamin A in terms of high calcium, low vitamin A, and also calcium to phosphorus. So I was quite a fan of that. Um, I have goat cheese gouda, which I realize has more vitamin A, but still, when I looked at it, it was still a good ratio. Um, buffalo mozzarella is another one I put in here and played with. Um, Manchego, pecorino, I tried a bunch of them. Really, any of them will do a similar job. Um, and of course, you can vary them, right? Different cheeses with each meal, potentially. So I put in about a 50 gram serving per meal. Um, that's a very moderate amount of cheese in my experience. Uh, I could easily have more than that, but we'll see when we look at nutrition. That's that's quite a lot of protein and fat, even just that amount. Um, now, oh, yeah, just to go back, why have I done MCT oil? I mean, normally if you have potatoes, you would cook them in, like, um, butter or beef fat, right? That's probably the tastiest options. Um, but butter, to me, it's got all the vitamin A without any of the calcium, without any of the protein. So I can't really see the benefit of it. Um, unless I wanted to have more vitamin A. So that's why I... And, and uh, yes, it has other beneficial things, like I've talked about like the odd chain fatty acids, but then so does cheese. So basically there's nothing in butter that isn't in... There's nothing beneficial in butter that isn't also in cheese. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But cheese yes. also has, for me, protein and calcium. So that's why, to me, cheese is the thing that makes sense. If you want to reduce your protein and your calcium, then maybe butter would make more sense. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, awesome. Now, I've also put hearts of palm in there. It's a bit of a wild card. Uh, it's obviously a very small amount. I put in 70 grams per day. So this is like one of these little hearts of palm of two meals. I put in that in there. First of all, I enjoy them. Yes, I know canned is not great. It's going to have a bit of aluminium and stuff. Um, but it added in a nutrient that I wanted more of. Uh, in fact, a couple. It added in folate and it added in manganese, which are otherwise low. Um, so actually, let's just have a look at that one before I... Uh, and then we'll add the black beans after, because this is pretty close to what I might eat if I were 
If I really wanted to love what I eat, this might be it. <laughs> so let's see what it does. <laughs> uh, so first of all, in terms of ratios of things, it's not that high carbs, I have to give it that. In fact, because I just removed the black beans, I think I would, my potato is going to be slightly higher. So let's, let's change that to uh, 1,200. I just want to comment as well, going through this chronometer, chronometer um, app, it's really nice to see the different levels of the minerals, the vitamins, and everything else, because it, it gives you a whole nother perspective. Yeah. You know, in, in, my, it... in my other app that I'm looking at, I'm really mostly focused on my macros, but this is so in-depth, so it's a really, really great look. It's good, and so far I'm just on the free trial, by the way. I think you can pay, but uh, not for this. this. So this is 100% free. This is like a big chronometer ad, actually, this episode, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will if it works. If it's, good, if it's a good product, it's a good product. Um, yeah, exactly. So you can see, all right, so this probably is about right. About 35% calories from carbs, 38% from fat, 28% from protein. That probably is about right. That's what I do. I don't, I'm not keto, but I'm definitely not high carb either. This is really what agrees with me. And it's about 3,000 calories. Honestly, I might be more than that in reality. Sometimes I learn more of some of these things. But let's say this is like, a, you know, on a restrained day. Um, I know sometimes it's 4,000 calories, but let's say this is like the minimum. So if I look through it, uh, I mean, an amazing omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, right? Uh, something like 5 to 4. Um, obviously, high amounts of saturated fat compared to a mono unsaturated. But this is this is because the MCT oil mainly. That's what's boosted to saturated so far. It's kind of saturated fat, but MCT is really in its own category. So I'm not worried that's too much saturated fat because um, it's really MCT oils. And so with the amino acids, um, I'm happy with this other than you know the glycine, but I've boosted the glycine, obviously, by taking more glycine like we talked about. Um, as I said, you know, different strategies, right? You can use college, if you were to use collagen peptides and like your proline would also go up, your hydroxyproline would also go up. So that's a different um, strategy. So I'm getting a reasonable amount of thiamine and riboflavin. Uh, I'm getting a good amount of niacin, pantothenic acids, all pretty much close to 100%. Uh, a good amount of B6, B12. Um, I wish I had biotin in here, but uh, it's, I believe it's a reasonable amount as well, these foods. I think beef is reasonably high in biotin. It's a good amount of choline, which is good because I need more than average with my genetics, right? Um, I've actually stopped supplementing choline for a while now and feeling no detriment. So I think that's why, because of the amount of beef I'm having. Um, the folate is still pretty low. Now, I'm happy to uh, supplement folate. It's very easy to supplement. And also, even if it were 100%, at the moment, I'm trying to get like three or 400% of the daily value of folate. Um, so this is a sacrifice of a simple diet like this. Like when I say simple, I mean... If I were to have lots of more plant foods in there, I could easily get that folate high, but I'm choosing not to do that because of some of the downside of those plant foods, right? Now, the vitamin A is also high, but you notice it's not devastating despite having 150 grams of cheese. We're, we're still only seeing about 16%, uh, pretty much all from retinol. So that's not crazy, right? Vitamin C, I'm getting well over 100% of that, so I don't really need to supplement that. Still not getting enough vitamin E, so I can make that judgment call if I believe it's a good thing and I want to supplement it or not. I'm actually pretty close to getting 100% even of the vitamin K, but as we said, it's in the form of K1. So I'm probably going to supplement with K2 anyway, which is pretty much impossible to get to from food. But you can see this is really the reason I added this cheese. There you go. Right there. Calcium, 122%. Calcium. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, you know, the repeat fellows talk about trying to get a one-to-run -one ratio of calcium to phosphorus. That's pretty much impossible to do from my experience unless you have like, um, if you were having no animal flesh and like all your protein was coming from dairy, you can do it. But if you're having a substantial amount of meat, then you're going to have high phosphorus. So this kind of ratio of two to one phosphorus to calcium, I'm happy enough with it. Um, I'm okay with that. Uh, the copper... Uh, you know, it's high-ish, but you can see 120% copper versus 240 zinc. So I'm still well in the, um, you know, zinc being dominant level. So I'm happy with that. Uh, I've got a decent amount of iron, not crazy. I've got a decent amount of magnesium. I'll still supplement on top, but it's nice to know if I don't, I'm still reaching my daily value, which most people don't from their normal diet. Uh, 
Now this manganese, in my last test I was actually really low in manganese and it turns out that manganese is very important for mitochondrial function of the type that my test shows that I'm not doing well in. So I'm like, right, I've got to get more manganese. So I decided rather than supplementing it, I want to get it from Hearts of Palm. Oh, um, so interesting. So that's why you've thrown those in there. Okay. Other than the taste, let's see what it does to remove it. I think some of it also comes from the cheese, but not that much. So it's only 70 gram, right? It's a tiny amount. Let's see what it does. Yeah, so that's 87%, which is fine. But as I said, I'm actually deficient. So I wanted to bo boost it. And obviously, if I wanted to boost it more, I could have, you know, whatever, 150 grams of hearts of palm to really go for it. So I can kind of do that by taste, partly. Um, and you can see it boosted other things. Hearts of palm, it kind of looks like it's empty calories, but it's actually, you can see the magnesium is now a bit lower. Uh, I don't know what else. I, I think some of the vitamins, it, uh, it's affected fairly substantially. Yeah, the riboflavin is a little bit lower now. Folate's significantly... Oh, no, folate was already low. But anyway, it boosts it boosts things a bit. Um, selenium's still really high. Uh, zinc is still really high. Uh, the potassium is still decently high, right? 150% of daily value. So, so, yeah, that's, you know... So I'm happy to supplement K2, supplement folate. And so that's why I'm happy with this diet. Um, now, I know we spent a long time in this, so... Um, any questions or any comments on this before I move on, Chrissy? No, I would just say that if you're just listening, go check it out on YouTube so you can actually see the visual and the screen share that we're doing because it's also very helpful. But um, no, this is, like I said before, it's really nice to see it all laid out, to see what the percentages are, and also to see how just by changing one item can move things around. Absolutely. All right, well, let's look at a palmitonia diet. So palmitonia is like the opposite of the liver, beef, and potatoes type of diet. Um, and honestly, it feels very restrictive a lot of the time to people when they have this diagnosis given to them. You might have felt that, Chrissy, if you were very. taking it seriously to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to look at, like, what's an example of a reasonably um, diverse, so there is a bit more, um, what's the word, variation in here, because of that feeling of being limited, but also really just a diet that as much as the beef and potato or beef and rice or whatever, 100% hits the hepatonia diet. I, I thought let's put together a, a diet here that 100% hits the palmitonia diet. So the things that are supposed to be very beneficial for palmitonia is fish, especially um, shellfish. So I included shrimp there. I think a lot of people enjoy eating shrimp um, and prawns, right? That's considered like a, maybe not as luxurious as lobster and crab, but still, you know, like people enjoy it. Um, and then like rice, I put in the nori sheets. I thought, you know, it's be a little bit Japanese about it. Um, a little bit of seaweed. Now, generally this is a lower fat diet, the palmitonia. Um, but I thought uh, avocado, I believe is allowed. So I put in one avocado a day. Um, now, buckwheat, along with fish, is supposed to be one of the most healing things for um, the palmitonia type. So I put in a decent amount of uh, cooked buckwheat, buckwheat noodles. And I know from experience that buckwheat noodles are most enjoyable when they are mixed with a bit of salt and sesame oil. <laughs> so I put a little bit of sesame oil in there, two teaspoons of sesame oil. Um, and then, you know, I could have added like spring onions or, you know, like anything else like that for flavor, potentially. Um, but I kept it as simple as that because I know from experience buckwheat noodles plus sesame oil plus salt is actually pretty tasty. Like that's fine, especially if that is, you know, along with some some fish, right? Um, and then, of course, one of the other things that's super beneficial for these types is green juice. <laughs> so I put in, um, you know, about just under half a pint of cucumber, just under half a pint of celery. So it's, you know, the classic cucumber and celery. And if you want spinach, or arugula or whatever kind of green juice, right? So does that sound familiar? Does that look like a kind of palmitonia diet? That's... That looks very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And some white rice, like some sushi-ish element to it, right? I didn't actually put sushi, but, you know, like white rice and nori and then buckwheat. Okay. So as I said, it's not. I mean, I followed this diet for several years, you know, more strictly than you, Chrissy. Uh, I would say this combination... I mean, I never really like fish and a lot of people don't. And if you don't, fair enough. But um, if you like fish, 
I would say, you know, this with a bit of flavoring, you know, obviously you can add some salt, soy sauce, you know, whatever. Um, so kind of sauces. It's actually pretty tasty. It's actually pretty good. Um, that's my uh, opinion experience anyway. So let's have a look at what it does nutritionally. So it's got a very decent amount of protein again, right? Oh, and, and it's doable. That's the other thing. You know, again, 150 grams of protein per meal, three meals a day, um, and about 300 grams of grain coming from between rice uh, and buckwheat per meal. Again, it's kind of doable serving with a little bit of, you know, other stuff, nourishment, and then a green juice in between. I think that's doable in a day. Now, obviously, this is for someone my size with my calorie needs, but you would scale that back. You know, if you're trying to lose weight or whatever and you want to go more to 1,500 calories and you're a small person, then obviously you'd have less. But you can see, you know, it's 29% protein, so it's certainly hitting the protein marker. It's higher ratio of carbs to fat than I was having in mind, although it's not massively different. You could certainly, you know, you could remove or reduce the avocado. You could remove or reduce the sesame oil. You could, you know, I've, the, two out of the three fish I've chose here are quite fatty, the salmon and sardines. But certainly if you swap one of them, like uh, salmon for cod or, you know, something like that, then it would reduce the, it would reduce that very show of well, like, uh, and fat. The, uh, yeah, definitely. And I see the sardines you chose in water instead of in oil. So that's even though it's still a little bit fatty, but you, you have a choice there depending as well. And I didn't choose, you know, swordfish, tuna, stuff like that, because it is just full of mercury, you know? Totally, yeah. I know some people, again, people we've had on... Um, are just 100% against fish. I would say, look, yeah, it's true, it is all contaminated. But uh, from what I've seen, the amount of mercury and some of the other things in sardines is like a thousandth of the amount as the amount in swordfish and tuna. So while it does all have some, it does have significantly less. Uh, you know, are these the kind of fish you would eat, Chrissy, if you were eating fish or...? Yeah, I mean, I love salmon for sure. I, I don't mind sardines. It wouldn't be something that I probably would want every day. Um, so I might mix that out with um, like a white fish um, and shrimp as well. Again, like shrimp. Then I would always go to, oh, and I love a scallop. Scallops, you know, okay. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's absolutely interchangeable, right? I mean, yeah, I, I used to enjoy scallops as much as I enjoy any seafood. I can see that. Um, so we can look at maybe how a couple of those change, but let's have a look at this first as, as a representative example. So we're looking at um, uh, omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. Again, probably the best one we've seen so far, right? Notice how It's a lot these... higher, but the ratio is really yes. good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely higher levels of both. Uh, so if you're a pure repeat, you wouldn't approve of that. But um, just in terms of the... Kind of everyone agreeing that a higher ratio of omega three to omega six is better these days. It's it's ticking that box. Um, so it's got a lot of protein, as we talked about, but not what I'd call excessive. And if we look at the nutrition again, ever so slightly lower in thiamine than I'd ideally like, um, but it's you know it's okay. Uh, decent amount of riboflavin, niacin, B five, B six, B twelve. Very similar, like you know, meeting those. B vitamin needs as you know the beef and potatoes I would say yeah but the biotin is a little concerning um I don't know if this is accurate uh what, what we might have to do a follow-up on that I think it's just rarely measured so I think this is just a case where one of these foods actually has a biotin value um, <laughs> right. so that wouldn't... makes sense that makes sense yeah, <laughs> yeah. uh choline is also pretty good look at that it's Again. not bad. I mean, I have to say compared to the meat diet, you know, the at least we're hitting here, we're looking at 103% in the palmatonia diet. For the more hepatonia, more meat-based, it was it was higher. So if you are somebody, you know, like both of you, both of us where our genetic um, de needs are higher for choline. Yeah. That might be uh, something to look at, yeah. Yeah, and both of us have that, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. So yeah, it just shows even if we have opposite diets, we can still both achieve it, right? Yeah, absolutely. But you can see actually the folate, because again, folate is usually more plant foods. So the folate is like easily met with this diet, which is great. However, eh, if you're trying to this, avoid vitamin A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not going to work on this from? one. Yeah. So where's that coming from? That is coming from the oily fish and it's coming from the greens, very simply. So if you removed... Uh, 
salmon and sardines you said like replace them with um and we'll do that in a minute like white fish or something and then we remove the arugula and the spinach i suspect it's going to be massively lower but we'll try the experiment in a sec but yeah that's a lot of vitamin a uh and it is but it is mainly in the uh non-animal form though right some people think that matters they, they claim that retinol is the bad form so there you go uh vitamin c decent amount of that d now i said it's very hard to get your d from food i stand by that but uh oily fish is actually an exception to that so i'm pretty sure what that is where that comes from in fact we can check that oh okay okay so i think it is actually talking about d2 not d3 it's the same issue as the k1 and k2 so in that case, it is probably coming from, hmm, let me see, I actually don't know. I think it's this one. Yeah, I think it's this thing. Um, I actually don't know where it's coming from, but if it's not the um, animal foods, it's going to be D2. So I wouldn't feel like that would satiate my uh, vitamin D needs. Yeah. So that's something you have to be aware when it comes to the vitamin D and vitamin K on all these listings is in many cases, it's the wrong kind that it's going to give you. Uh, so it's, you know, good level of vitamin E, very high level of vitamin K1. Um, good amount of calcium. Now that calcium, that's going to come from the sardines. That's one of the reasons I put the sardines in there. Um, so we'll swap out the sardines for like, as you said, white fish and we'll swap the shrimp for the scallops maybe, and we'll see what that does. Um, it's got some, I, I think the iodine on the state is probably over hundred percent. I think, um, it's just most of the foods don't have it listed. Uh, we didn't really see iodine before actually looking at different food tables, both the diets we've talked about, iodine is quite high in cheese and it's reasonable in beef. Um, and it is high in seafood. So either of the diets we just talked about would be over 100% iodine, in my experience, looking at different food tables. Um, iron, decent amount of magnesium again, well over 100%. Very high level of manganese, possibly too much, unless someone's deficient. Um, you know, the phosphorus to calcium ratio is similar to the one that I said I was happy with before. Potassium's decent, selenium's decent more sodium naturally from the fish in that before you add it. So the only thing, you see it's pretty great as well, nutritionally. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, not as, as good for zinc. Is good, just gonna say that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the copper to zinc ratio is not as good. Um, and so this is a thing, especially if you have zinc deficiency, if you're a man, if you have low um, immunity, all of that kind of stuff, you know, you might wanna supplement with zinc with a diet like this. Uh, but for you know yourself, Chrissy, you might be just fine with it potentially, or just supplement it occasionally. Um, but you can see a diet like this is pretty good, right? It's pretty, um, you know, covering everything that you need. Now, why don't we just first of all try swapping out the two that you just said there? So we'll swap out shrimp for scallops. So that's a preference. Scallops cooked, fifty gram. And we'll swap out the um, sardines for uh, like a white fish. What, what would be an example? Like a. I guess you could do just a cod or something like that. Cod, okay, yeah. Um, Pacific cooked, let's say. Go from fresh. All right, so let's see what that does to things. So, oh yeah, first of all, it is going to reduce the amount of fat, like I said, significantly. Yeah, because uh, those are both, uh, well, sorry, it was the, yeah, sardines are still a fatty fish, even if they're in water. Yeah, and the salmon so too, so yeah. But we left the salmon. Oh, did we leave the salmon? Yes, 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 sorry. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we did talk about FODMAPs before, a little bit of FODMAPs, but nothing, I think that would be a problem for someone of IBS, so it's kind of going along with that as well enough. Um, obviously, it's got more you know, polyunsaturated fat. So it shifted the balance a bit more to omega-6, but still very much in the healthy range compared to by any normal standards. Um, it's got a decent amount of protein. Let's see, what's it changed? So all of these are pretty similar, I would say, from memory. Um, 
Vitamin A is a little bit less. So yeah, like I said, the two sources of vitamin A are going to be the greens and then the oily fish. So we've removed an oily fish. So that's made that a bit lower. Um, the D we think is probably D2. Uh, yeah, it's reduced the calcium, right? As I was expecting, but it's still not crazy low. Uh, but I think that's because a lot of the other calcium is going to be from things like spinach, where it's not really a digestible. Um, the buckwheat, where it's not going to be very digestible. So yeah, in terms of digestible calcium, that's taken a big hit. But maybe you don't want calcium, right? That depends on the person. Um, the copper is lower, which is you know, probably a good thing. Uh, the zinc is also lower though. Selenium's still high, potassium's still high. You know, it hasn't changed things hugely, basically. It's just reduced the fat and the calcium a bit, basically. But you're still hitting most of those markers, still very high in manganese. Still getting enough iron as well, you know, in terms of anemia. I know you're someone genetically who needs more iron. Yes, um, yeah. So you can see, even opposite diet, like there was no overlap between what I said my current preference diet was and this one, right? Very different, and in terms of obviously energy from Eastern medicine or us, that's completely polar opposite. This is cooling and alkaline, the other one is uh, you know, more heating and acidic. Um, and yet, you know, they're both still meeting your nutritional needs pretty much in most cases. As I said, K2, D3 are kind of exceptions. D3 you're meant to get from sunlight. K2, ideally, you would have a bacteria in your um, digestive tract making you plenty, but unfortunately a lot of people don't these days. Um, so we'll save that one. Well, okay, so let's now, for fun, create a Chrissy's Meal Yesterday category. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and see what we have. Now this is obviously gonna be more difficult because you're not eating like isolated things. Um, so we're gonna have to do some approximations, but we'll do our best. So if you could read them out to me, please. Yes, of course. So I started off with um, a couple slices of some multigrain sourdough. It's usually about 85 grams, somewhere in there, 85 to 100 grams. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. So I'm not sure if we made you sit, we made you sit through adding all those if we just cut to when they're all added, but this is uh, Chrissy's meal on Sunday. Um, do you want to just list out some what you had, Chrissy? Yeah, so a cup, of course. So a couple slices of uh, toast for my breakfast, one with peanut butter, the other one with Marmite and cheese. Um, lunch was just a light snack because I was going to have a nice roast dinner later. And that snack was just a, a cracker, um, one of those Dr. Cargs, if anybody's familiar with those, with some um, cottage cheese spread on top. And then dinner was a roast chicken, roast potatoes, gravy. Uh, Yorkshire pudding and broccolini. Awesome. I'm actually feeling hungry just hearing the description. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. It's close to my dinner time. Okay, great. Um, so let's see how you did then. So you got 20% protein, 40% carbs, 40% fat. Uh, now, there's a bit of approximation here. We we're kind of guessing how much fat was in the roast potatoes, you know, the Yorkshire puddings, you know, that's going to vary a lot as well. So there's at least a 5% margin for error there, I'd say. But um, is that kind of normally what you aim for with your macros, Chrissy? Um, yeah, I try to go a, a lot higher with the protein. I try and be more kind of, you know, so my protein and my fat would swap. So I'd rather be at 40% protein and 20% fat. Okay. All right. So this was a more indulgent day. I just yes. asked you what you had yesterday, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so normally you would have more 
like lean protein of every meal because in this Correct. case you did have protein every meal but it was like peanut butter and cheese which is very high fat right exactly exactly yeah okay um and then of course also just a roast dinner by definition mm -hmm. is going to have fat um okay so let's see but let's see how it is nutritionally um so yeah just about 100 percent of fiber um yeah, you can see not a great omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. No, um, that's bad. So, yeah, that's less than a gram and over seven grams. So, wow. Ju okay. Just a, pe just a peanut butter probably would yeah. do that. I mean, because we actually, in terms of these other fats, uh, we didn't specify, like the Yorkshire pudding. We said olive oil, so that's not really it's a little bit of omega-6. But, yeah, I imagine that's mainly the uh, peanut butter. Um. In fact, yeah, we don't have to imagine. We can just check. What does it say? Sorry, one sec. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of omega-6, obviously, depending on the size serving you have. Um, this was for, yeah, per, tea, per tablespoon. Okay. And... Then, sorry, where were we? Yeah, so high omega-6. I think that's probably right. Um, I mean, obviously, if you roasted your potatoes in coconut oil, it would have been a bit less, but you did olive oil, right? Um, yeah, correct. With the Yorkshire puddings, similar-ish. Um, or if you used beef tallow or whatever, right, that would be less omega-6. But there we go. Um, okay, so protein, as I said, pretty low compared to what you normally have. Still well over what's supposed to be the, you know, decade recommended daily value though for uh yeah based on a 2000 calorie diet which is probably what you're going for right 2000 yeah roughly somewhere in between like 17 to 2000 so actually this according to this you didn't reach your 2000 calories this is 1600 calories so this is like no, a lose exactly. weight even though it sounds like um it was quite what's the word uh indulgent it was certainly not um and also, too, I mean, maybe I had a little bit more chicken. Maybe I had a little bit more potato. We are approximating. Possibly. I was definitely not hungry by the end of the day, so it might be a little bit more. But it's really nice to look at um, the targets, what we really hit, you know, yes. as far as that. And this is where it is fun to actually measure these things sometimes. I mean, you certainly don't want to get, like, uptight and do it every day, but um, just, like, occasionally measure it just so you have some concept of the reality of, uh, you know, what it actually is. With these things um and just in terms of macronutrients you know because everything is lower that means you are also lower in the potentially inflammatory amino acids uh but yeah glycine is really low um so you know not a lot of that calming uh, no, amino acids definitely not um but yeah look at, now i expected these b vitamins to be high mainly because of the marmite Right, so yes. marmite. For those of you in the US who don't know, is like a yeast extract that is inexplicably popular in the UK. Um, it just kind of stinks, but it, the advertising campaign is all like you either love it or hate it, right? So yeah, well, I have to say, it took me many, many years to love marmite. I had to taste, try it over and over and over again until my taste buds adjusted. <laughs> Fair enough, uh, but because of that, you're hitting, you know. A lot of those. I think pantothenic acid, it's just kind of in everything. So it's probably just a reflection of, as we said, at least in terms of what we measured here, it's just a fairly low calorie diet. Um, now, B12 is also pretty low. Uh, I'd say it's the reflection of low animal food, right? You only had, uh, well, let's say a dead I just animal had the once. chicken, yeah, yeah, exactly. Once on that day, rather than three times, like all other, other examples. Um, low choline. Folate is good. Not that high vitamin A either. Yeah, not too bad. Only 25%. Yeah. And large amounts of vitamin C. Reasonable amount of vitamin E. Lots of K1. I think that's mainly the broccolini, I would guess. And a reasonable amount of calcium. That's probably, you know, your cheese again, more than anything. And possibly also peanut butter. Let's see, actually. So it's definitely a cheese. Oh, yeah, you know, you cheese twice, right? So the gallo cheese and the cottage cheese. Um, and, yeah, probably a little bit of also in the broccolini and the bread, sourdough bread, and the, um, and yeah, that's probably the main things. 
So you've got a reasonable amount of calcium. That might be enough calcium for someone who's, you know, not deficient and not worried about it. Um, pretty low amount of copper. So again, how you feel about that might depend on how you feel about copper in general. Um, but not a great amount of zinc either. So, you know, these are the kind of micronutrient things that if, certainly in case of zinc, that if you always ate this way, you're going to end up, you know, zinc deficient, basically. Right, yeah. Uh, if you don't supplement at all. Um, iodine is reasonably high in dairy, but that's pretty much it. So you probably would be low in iodine as well, I'd say, with this diet. Um, iron, you know, we need, you know, you need more iron, so this is not covering your iron needs, I would say. Um, magnesium, the more stress you have, the more magnesium you need, so it's probably not covering your magnesium needs. Um, your manganese is fine, your phosphorus is fine. Potassium, as we talked about, you need more when you're stressed, but it's not bad, a little bit on the low end maybe. Yeah. Not too bad. It's showing up at almost 99% here. Yeah, which is you know, fine by any normal standards. And especially, as you said, you might have eaten a bit more than it looks like. So it might be fine. Again, probably mainly pot uh, potatoes giving you that. Um, and then selenium, uh, you know, fine, unless you're deficient. I'd say it's a good amount of selenium. So, yeah, just kind of the usual suspects, really. What, what do people generally say you need to supplement, right? They generally say you need to supplement zinc. Well... You know, this diet, yes. They generally say you need to supplement magnesium. Well, this diet, diet, yes. They generally say you need to supplement iron if you're a woman, menstruating age. Well, with this diet, yes. <laughs> um, you're noticing a pattern here. Um, they sometimes, they used to say more that you need to supplement calcium. It's especially an issue for women as they get older, right? Um, they're more worried about osteoporosis. I think it's a lot more common in women. So, you know, maybe. Um, and... I mean, if you weren't having the Marmite, you'd probably be low in B vitamins as well. Um, you know, including choline, if you want to class that as a B vitamin. So, now obviously, this is a little bit of an unfair comparison because we're comparing 1,600 calories for you versus almost 3,000 calories for me. But I don't, if you're actually eating 1,600 or let's say 2,000 calories, the thing is, you need to you need to get the nutrients from the amount of calories you're eating, right? Yes. So this is where if you and I both need the same amount of choline, say, hypothetically, because of our genes, then you need to get the same amount that I get from 3,000 calories and 2,000 calories, right? Precisely, yeah. That's just the way it is, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, same for a lot of these nutrients. So this is definitely not to make you feel bad about the diet. I know this is an indulgent day, but... I think this is like a fairly normal, healthy diet. I think this is actually, you know, you picked it fairly well. When I speak to a lot of clients and talk about what they eat during the day, a lot of the time it is like some kind of what I call reasonably decent meal at night with like meat or fish, some kind of carb like potato or rice or whatever, and some kind of vegetables. Um, but then during the day, they're often just having these what I call snacky foods, you know, not real meals. Um, and, you know, it varies a lot, but yeah, like some of these elements like nuts or seeds are often part of it. Uh, dairy is not always part of it. Some kind of cracker or bread is often part of it. Um, some kind of salad is often part of it. So yeah, if you're recognizing any of this, that's kind of the point, right? Like you might think, oh, I'm eating a healthy, balanced diet, but you might actually be getting less of your nutritional needs than someone who's only eating beef and potato or you know beef and rice or whatever right crazily that's the thing that is hard to get your head around i think until you actually see it for yourself right so that's really the point of this is to see it for yourself and of course this is not fair and chrissy because this is um what's the word i sprung this on her with no notice and she's just telling us telling me what she had yesterday uh, <laughs> i don't know you do as you say you usually eat more protein but um and, you know, if you had more protein, probably you would have more of all these nutrients. That's the case, right? Yeah. Well, definitely what this is spurring me on to do is to go onto this app and work out a few few different scenarios with my food to actually check, like, when I am upping my protein, am I benefiting in my minerals and my nutrients or not? Or do I need to ch change it up and shift it up a little bit? Yeah. And again, you know, all of this is in the realm of optimization. I know you're already yeah, healthy. Totally. And People who are already healthy can get away with a hell of a lot more than people who aren't, 
quite simply, you know, and you are healthier than me. Um, I think mainly because of the lead toxicity at this stage, I've dealt with so much other stuff, but you know, it is what it is. Um, and so absolutely, you know, you'll be fine on things that I wouldn't be or, you know, levels of zinc I wouldn't be. You know, zinc is, for instance, also among all the other things, it's an important ingredient for heavy metal detoxification, right? So it's more important for me to have that be high than you. And, you know, you might be okay with having it low for a long time compared to me. Um, so we all have different needs, of course, based on all kinds of different factors. But as you say, that you know, it's it's good to be able to see. It's also interesting that even though the palmitonia diet might have struck you as restrictive versus what you normally eat, Chrissy, um, that when I broke it down for you, like an example of how you could eat palmitonia, which is reasonably varied. I mean, it's got slightly less ingredients than what you listed there, but not much less, right? Um, like it is possible to meet all your nutritional needs. I don't know if this is just like unappealing to you. Like you're just like, ugh, I wouldn't like the no. taste of it. You know what it is as well, which I find it's the crunch. That's what I miss, you know, because there, it is so restrictive on certain things. So it's like finding, um, you know, like I was just sharing is like the having the Dr. Karg's biscuits because they're nice and crunchy, but within the palmitonia, like I don't believe like there's no wheat products or flour products. So that takes crackers and that kind of stuff out. So well, what it's about, like, well, wait, wait, what about buckwheat crackers? That's, they're very crunchy. Yeah, I could try that. I just haven't found a brand yet unless you've got some suggestions that you could send actually I've, I've eaten this one i think le pan de fleur i think this is available in the uk oh, okay. um, it doesn't this many nutrients unfortunately but it's it's basically just buckwheat so it's the same nutrient as <laughs> you know cooked buckwheat um so yeah there's buckwheat crackers that uh and there's buckwheat cereal i think as well that's crunchy um what else rice crackers uh you know those japanese rice crackers um, I used to love eating those that, that are covered in like soy sauce usually and sesame seeds and stuff like that. Right. I'll have that's to find me. I... Okay. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to look at it a little bit more. Cause th that's the thing as well. When I had tried buckwheat and some of the buckwheat cereals, like, eh, it's just, it was leaving me lacking a little bit, but I haven't tried the one that you recommended. So I can look around for a little bit more. Um, I think there was also two, what is it? It said, um, millet's fine. I've not really gone down that avenue um with in the palmatonia so you know there's a few few more things potentially to look at yeah with this i was just trying to pick like an almost ideal palmatonia diet because this is like i mean you know buckwheat is not just allowed it's supposed to be very healing for the type right beneficial greens just, exactly greens are not just allowed they're supposed to be very healing the fish is not just allowed they're supposed to be very healing so that's you know this is meant to be like an optimal palmatonia not just an allowed one um just similar to how beef, potato, and cheese is, you know, optimal, not just allowed for that particular type, if you believe in those kind of types. But the point is, you don't have to believe in the types, um, of course. And, you know, if, if you've been told, like Chrissy, that you're the Palmentonian type, you prefer the beef, potato, and cheese diet, well, the other thing would be to try that for a while, because if that's not good for you, you'd still, like, within a few months, you'd feel worse on it. Like, and that would help to guide you that oh, maybe this really isn't my type. Whereas if you kind of dabble here, there, and everywhere, then you, as long as you're healthy, you never find out what isn't isn't good for you. Um, so I get my clients to do that, right? I mean, like one of them was lucky that he happened to live near a practitioner who, you know, was a, had a doctorate in it and diagnosed him. And sure enough, she agreed with my, you know, evaluation. It wasn't a diagnosis. I just said, I think this might be you give it a try kind of thing. Um, but you know, a lot of people don't have that opportunity and, and of course maybe the diet, you know, the, the Korean thing is nonsense and there's no such thing as all the types and all the rest of it. But from my experience, it's interesting to give it a try. And so I want to give, well, in this case, at this, in this episode, at least we've done the, you know, two of the four opposites, um, and looked at like examples of, you know, optimal meals and, uh, while it might seem similar, like just going back to just the. So it's just the beef and potato, uh, beef, potato and cheese diet, basically, um, in terms of, you know, most of them are close to 100%. Like, yeah, you know, it's much higher zinc, it's much higher um, uh, potassium, you know, it has iron. the things in the ice, iron yeah. for those, yeah, mag yeah magnesium similar. Uh, it has the things in that I was specifically looking for, I guess. Um, choline as well, you know, 765. Um, so, you know, I'm happier with that from a nutritional point of view, but of course, you know, it's case by case. It depends on the person. And it's, it's so easy to get enough protein with a diet like this. It's actually, as I said, I kind of stopped taking the collagen protein partly because I'm like, I'm just taking, I'm eating a lot of protein, you know, <laughs> You're I, right, yeah. I, was like, I was getting close to 
you know, I mean, easily 250 grams, I could even have 300 grams of protein in there. It's like, I don't think, you know, that's not really necessary. That's, that's uh, probably a bit of a strain on my system. Um, so, yeah. So, for those watching, I hope that's been helpful. I imagine a lot of people are going to be uh, checking out the chronometer, <laughs> at least the ones watching, to uh, give it a try. Now, it has loads of, you know, functionality, which I am really not interested in because I'm not trying to lose weight or whatever. I'm literally just using this one section of it, but I guess it does a lot of other things as well. And food diaries for people to see, you know, their macros and are they meeting their needs and are they overdoing it and all that kind of stuff, which I'm sure is great. It's just, you know, I'm only using it for this specific purpose. Um, but I hope that this is now practical enough for people, starting with all the way right to the beginning where I was extremely strapped. Again, I gave two opposite diets and then, you know, yours as an example, um, just random diet, Chrissy, from a you know, healthy person, um, to say, you know, to again, demonstrate there is no one perfect diet. It depends on you. It depends on your genes. It depends on your type. Maybe if there is such a thing, it depends on your nutritional needs. It depends on your toxicities. It depends on your size. It depends on your activity. It depends on your lifestyle. It depends on a lot of different things. So that's why all these people out there who are selling you just follow this diet and all your health problems will go away or just follow this diet and you'll lose weight or whatever, they follow it because it just varies so much. So that's why uh, I wanted to do this, just to give you know practical examples of how you'd work it out for yourself. And if you're like, oh God, what does he mean by macros and what's this mineral and all that kind of stuff? We cover that in the previous episodes, right? We cover that in the... Uh, the Feel Younger Diet episode about macros. We went into explaining it all and, you know, because Chrissy and I are just talking about, uh, you know, it's this ratio, this ratio, blah, blah, blah. But if you don't know what we're talking about, check out those previous episodes to understand the theoretical framework behind all this. This, this episode is really possibly the last in the series where we're really just talking about the practical execution of all the stuff we did already cover before. Well said, Owen. And I'm really glad that you walked me through this app because the other app that I was using, like I said, I was just mainly focused really on the macros and it was a beautifully perfect for that. Which is good, but, yeah. Yeah, which is exactly what I needed it for. This, which I really like, especially if you're data-driven and especially if you really want to see what you're getting, this goes into depth with that. So thank you for introducing that to not only myself, but also to our listeners. So anything else that you want to add before we close? Uh, as usual, share with people who you think would like it. As usual, uh, go to YouTube if you're not there already and leave your comments underneath or Rumble. I am checking comments on Rumble as well. For It's more difficult to find them though, honestly. So only <laughs> use that if you don't like YouTube. Um, check out, look out for the book. It's It's been delayed again. So I don't know when it's going to be ready, uh, but I hope it's going to be ready soon. So, uh, you know, uh, look out for that um in rejuvenateblueprint.com when it stops redirecting to something else and it goes to the book then that, that'll mean it's ready uh and thank you so much for your time oh and i guess just quick product plug um geneticinsights.co slash is it nutrients or nutrition i guess chrissy will put it in the show notes geneticinsights.co slash i think it's nutrition um that's where you can check out our you know the the I think it's $50, $60 or something. It'll be, I'm pretty sure it's under $50 if you use our coupon code, Rejuvenate. And um, that'll tell you what you what your genetic need is for every vitamin we've talked about, every mineral we've talked about, every fat we've talked about, every amino acid we've talked about, and more. It's all in there. So to me, that's essential prerequisite information for building the perfect diet for you. It's not going to tell you everything you need to know, but it's like without it, you are literally just fumbling around in the dark guessing if you're really trying to optimize things. So definitely check that out. Beautiful. I will put that link below for in the episode description. Thank you again, everyone, our lovely listeners for joining us. Your time is valuable and we appreciate sharing our time with you. So please remember to hit that like and subscribe button, the bell icon, so you don't miss an episode. And we'll see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next.